Paul Wainwright, our journey to the west of Scotland was to be an emotional reunion with a landscape he first saw more than 40 years ago. Walking along above Loch Shieldhig, and this is really, really an inlet of Loch Torridon. There's the village in a beautiful crescent all the way around there. Well, shall we settle down here for a oh, minute? a nice bit of heather over here. The only way into Shield Egg in those days was the road from Loch Carron, about 12 miles. Beautiful day, I remember. And I had a strong feeling that I was the first visitor Shield Egg had ever had. There was no welcome at all, no bed and breakfast signs, no cafes, nothing. And there was no inn. Uh, I had to ask, well, is there not an inn in Shield Egg? No, no, no. There used to be. It was that building over there. If you go there, they might put you up for the night. So I went there, and uh, there was a widowed woman, Mrs. Lewis, and uh, she did put me up for the night. It was a very insular community. Obviously, they weren't accustomed to visitors at all. Nowadays, of course, it's vastly different. It's become very sophisticated. The village itself is bypassed by a new road, which has signs saying, turn into Shield Lake for services, bed and breakfast, hotels, meals, everything. But it, it's relatively unspoilt. We were to travel through a remote quarter of Scotland, from Shield Egg to the Five Sisters and beyond. It was a wild, mysterious environment that A.W. had fixed in his mind's eye. But as we found, walking by Court Hill House on the shores of Loch Kishorn, it was a landscape that was under the pressure of dramatic change. Now that's the house. That looks quite an evil place when it's raining and the clouds are low. Almost startling. It's been like this ever since I started coming to Scotland. And I always assumed it had been destroyed by fire. There's so many large houses in, in re remote parts of the north have been because the nearest fire brigade was at Inverness, 80 miles away, and there was no hope of saving them. But I learned recently that the house and the estate were bought by someone from outside who wanted particularly to use the grounds of the estate, didn't want to live in the house, and took the roof off deliberately to avoid paying rates on the place. And it's been like this for at least 40 years. But what I wanted to show you was Kisshorn, the oil rig installation at Kisshorn, which you can see from here. It's a remarkable apparition, isn't it? That's the Kisshorn oil rig installation, the subject of a great controversy about 15, 20 years ago. Now it's wound down. Its work's finished. Still, it, it remains to offend everybody's eyes as it comes along. It did bring, of course, prosperity to the area, and, and Loch Carran village especially benefited from the men who worked there. In fact, new houses were built for them, which I suppose will be for sale soon. How well kept the graveyard is. Somebody cares for it. You'd probably be able to trace the the population of this entire community with these names: yes. Gordons, yeah. Nicholsons, more Gordons. We turned from the decay of Kishorn 
and set our faces to the high wild region that A.W. has written about with such affection. To the lad from industrial Lancashire, who'd spent a lifetime on the gentler slopes of English Lakeland, this is an awesome landscape, the looming mass of the giants of Torridon. Torridon, to many admirers of natural grandeur, and especially to those in climbing boots who love to wander in high places, is Mecca, a goal to aspire to reach, the end of the search for uplift of the spirit, and to it they often return as pilgrims. The very name is a clarion call. It is strong, commanding, swashbuckling, suggestive of hell and high water, a little sinister, and a word that rolls well off the tongue, and the scenery more than matches it. Without the lock, Torridon would be a fearful place, but with it, there is not a grander prospect to be found in Scotland, and it is always fresh. The same scenes are photographed by the same cameras year after year, but the real atmosphere of Torridon cannot be taken back home. Which is why people have to go there again and again and again. So what, the, what lock is this? This is Loch Clare. And the mountain we're looking at is one of the giants of Torridon, Ligak. Not looking very friendly at the present time. But I think it's impressive like that. More impressive than under a blue sky. It's very difficult of access. You'd need to be a, a real he-man to get on Ligak. But I noticed last time I was past that the track is forming from the road. Very, very steep, unremitting for 3,000 feet almost. What amazes me looking at your, at your drawings is the way you capture a mountain like that, because I mean, th there are all sorts of features that you can pick out on this one, but that just looks like such a formidable chunk of solid, featureless well, it, rock. It does in this light, but it does break up into buttresses and cliffs. I have several photographs of this, and it's quite clear. Nature in the raw, unspoiled, unpolluted, out of sight and sound of the roads. Now, where do we go from here? If we walk, if we walk on through here, because I mean, the, the, yeah. the weather looks better away across there. It does. Now, that, that leads us into Coolin Forest. So uh, is, that, is that the east over there? No, that's south that's again. South this over is there. east. West, west is over there oh. where the sun is. Well, one of the things about, about Scotland is I lose my bearings here very quickly because the roads wind so much. Yeah. I mean, you can be going north-south one minute and east-west the next. Oh, careful of this bridge now. Not at all safe, that bit there. Don't lean against it. No, I think, I think you're very wise. Yeah. That's a splendid view, isn't it? That's Ben A. And the top of it, which is about five miles long, is completely covered with a quartzite scree. It's loose, it's difficult to walk upon. There are beautiful mountains here. And uh, there are very useful stalker's paths for getting around. There is a right of way and it's a beautiful walk. The thing to do, really, is, is to walk with another party and each park the car at either end and walk in opposite directions and swap the car keys, you see, <laughs> get back to base in the other's car. One of my favourite parts of the district is this. The silence of these places gets a bit frightening sometimes. Looks like a no-man's land, but it's actually teeming with life. A wonderful sanctuary for animals, isn't it? It is. You might as well do. Here's a nice dry spot. We'll have, we'll have ourselves a bit of a sit down. We're going to relax a bit. Why not? 
Mm, nice. Good enough to chew. I bet there was many a day when you weren't as lucky with the weather as this. There were a few days, but generally I did very well in Scotland. So when you'd taken your photographs of a place like this, I mean, you, you would go home from your week's trip and then... Take them, how, how long take after them to boots. <laughs> how long afterwards did you have to get around to doing, doing the drawings? I mean, would that be sort of winter evenings job, was it, when you, when you couldn't get out to walk? Well, it was, yes, but for 20 years I've been taking photographs and not doing any drawings. But fortunately, I'd had them all enlarged by a professional photographer. So they were there waiting to be done when I came to draw them. So do we carry on walking yeah. across that hillside over there as well? Uh, probably not to that today, but I do want you to see a valley up there, Glen Uig. It's across the valley. We're, we're now going to enter Eichnashavik Forest, which extends on both sides of the railway and the road. And going up through there is a forest road that leads into Glen Uy. South, there lies a wilderness of mountain and deer forest, uninhabited and rarely visited. A few solitary shooting lodges approached by rough tracks are the only visible evidences of man's occupation. There is neither accommodation nor hospitality for walkers and climbers. This is Morna one of the least accessible regions in Scotland. Only walkers experienced in rugged and hostile terrain should venture far amongst the mountains of Mona. I'll go and see if... Uh, <laughs> check we've got no trains on the way, do we? Uh, just hang on a second, I'll just... Uh... <laughs> we all right? This is the great lifeline between East and West, Inverness, Kyle of Loch House. Been under threat of closure for many years, but uh, they keep deferring it, and uh, it's still a very, very popular line. And the people of, on the villages of Plotton and so on depend on yeah. it. Yeah. So I think... Well, when you look at how, bad, how bad the roads are... Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> They're a bit muddy around here. Oh, there was talk of closing the line and improving the road. But that, that was never uh, adopted. I feel sorry for trees when they're grown like that. Never get a chance. Well, that's it's just like growing telegraph poles. Do you regard match stems as litter? I never regard them as litter, do you? No, I don't. I'm... I just throw them down anyway. I think the old matchstick's not going to make much difference. <laughs> well, it's much more pleasant out of the forestry, I've got to say. Yeah. And this track That's continues marvelous. about another three miles to a shooting lodge. That's the reason for its existence here. Yeah. Just look at that, though. That's magnificent, isn't it? Those are the mountains of Coolin Forest. And beyond those, but not visible from here, are the mountains of Torridon. Do these peaks have individual names, or is it oh, all yes. actually all one mountain? No, no, no. There are six Munros there in that group. Six mountains over 3,000 feet. And each quite individual. I mean, you can't climb one and then just walk across to the next. You've got to go down again and up again. It's really a plateau that's dissected by glens and the deep glens too. Probably at one time it was all an uneven mass. But if the view's as good here, as we climb on up, it's bound to get better, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And you were pretty, pretty close to the cloud base up here. Yes. Presumably, most of the time you came to Scotland, it was fairly 
cloudy, rainy weather. I mean, the, the Scott is mainly like that, isn't it? I could always depend on three good days in a week, and the other three were probably cloudy. Days like that were very disappointing. Days like this were a great reward, though. You must have been tempted from time to time to say, oh, hang getting the McBrain's bus, I'll just stay on for another few days. I couldn't afford to do that. Holiday times were very fixed. It was a week. So Sunday to Saturday and I had to be back. But uh, since moving into the lake, just of course, I never minded going back, because that's equally beautiful. When you went home from a place like this to the lakes, though, I mean, you must have felt that the lakes was an awfully spoiled place. To some extent, and an awfully flat place, too. It's surprising. Great natural swimming pool down there, AW. Yeah. Typical Highland burn. Beautiful. And you can be sure nobody's ever bathed in it. Now, if that was within five yards of Hyde Park, it'd be full of people, wouldn't it? What was your first impression coming to this very different sort of landscape? Oh, uh, I thought it was wonderful. Nothing like this in the Lake District, actually. It's far wilder. Far grander than the Lake District, but as I say, it hasn't the romantic beauty of, of the Lake District, which appealed to me first of all. So you never thought you never thought of uh, applying for the job of town clerk of Fort William? So you no, no, step of this oh, no, landscape. no. I was satisfied to stay in the Lake District. No, that never appealed to me. I couldn't live here. Why not? Well, I'm, I'm fond of solitude and loneliness, but you get rather too much of it. I like to still go and watch Blackburn Rovers twice a year, and I like the Lake District. You probably wouldn't get a very good picture for Coronation Street on the telly if you no. lived in a valley like this, either. No, it would. <laughs> From the mountains of Torridon and the Coolin Forest, our path was south to Loch Alsh and Loch Duich. We were tramping the road to the Isles in search of a particular place that had special memories for Wainwright. The road to the Isles reaches its final stages at the watershed of Cluny, and from here to the western coast, the scenery is a fitting climax to a grand and memorable Highland journey. Lovely though Loch Duich is, and lovely though the contributing valleys are, it is the mountains that make the scenery here so magnificent. The five sisters of Kintail, elegant and yet powerful, form a graceful and imposing background at the head of the loch and their steep slopes border Glen Shiel for several miles, like a gigantic wall. We are now at the summit of the Mamratigan Pass, and a couple of centuries ago, this was the only road to Sky. It leads you to a, a ferry, Kyle Rea Ferry, with Sky only 500 yards on the other side, and, and that, at, at one time, was the usual way to Skye. So this was the, the narrowest crossing from the mainland to Skye? Yes, yes, took advantage of that. What we're looking at is the area known as Kintail. The lock below is Loch Duick. Now, a Mr. Percy Unner, who was a president of the Scottish Mountaineering Club, a great climber, actually, bequeathed all his estate to the National Trust with certain conditions which have been faithfully observed ever since. There was to be no afforestation, no signposts, no way marking, no paths made. It was to be left exactly as it was at the time he'd bequeathed it. The whole area is open to walkers and climbers. 
the motorists have no access to it at all. And uh, it's now managed by an employee of the National Trust. Wainwright wanted to see these mountains at close quarters, off the tourist route, from the tranquillity of Glen Leaked, and in the company of that man from the Scottish National Trust. Alan Whitfield, one-time airline pilot, brought up in the Lake District, is now the guardian of the Glen. But even this place, behind its fortress of mountains, has been swept by change. So I think there was probably between two and three hundred people living in this Glen. And they were cleared to make room for sheep to make room for sheep, yes. You can actually find and identify seven crofting communities yeah. in the length of this glen from ruins. Yeah. Um, but they say they all... Now there's nothing. Now there's nothing. Yeah. Nothing mm. but space out of doors. It was the border sheep men that took over these mm. estates. Mm. And at the peak of the sheep boom, there was over 10,000 sheep on Kintail. Mm. And what's quite interesting also, considering that this was well over 100 years ago, they were paying £6,000 a year rent for the grazing here. Now, £6,000 in uh, the 1840s, 1850s was a lot of money, you know. People come here who've walked in the Lake District and yeah. say, well, I'm used to walking in the Lake District. Yeah. There is nowhere, I think, in the Lake District that one goes from virtually sea level up to over 3,000 feet in no. one go. Yeah. You see, here we're standing, Glenleaf House is, I think, about 330 feet above sea level. Yeah. Uh, so you're starting even here. Um, 3,000 foot climb. 3,000 yeah. foot climb. And people do tend, when they come here, to underestimate how long it's going to take them. Yeah. They think they're going to travel far faster. Yeah. And we normally tell people now to allow in these hills two miles an hour and another hour for every thousand feet they climb. Yeah. Um, and then they're on the safe side. Yeah. But uh, the other thing, of course, in comparison with the Lake District today is that we don't have as many people. Uh, but are the numbers of people increasing? The numbers of people are increasing. I, I think the numbers coming are doubling every year at the moment. Actually, out onto the hills. Uh, and the increase in wild camping uh, is tremendous. The number of people now who are going off for two or three days at a time and camping out in the quarries, uh, which is a nice thing to see, uh, as long as they remember to clean up after them. Today's memorial to Man in the Hills may be the ubiquitous beer can and crisp paper, but it's the prints of man from another age that stamp a sense of mystery on the landscape, a spirit of endurance and inventiveness. A.W. wanted to show me one such signpost to the past, a monument near Glenelg that's glowered at highland wind and weather for nearly 2,000 years. Well, this is the best surviving example of a, an Iron Age brock in Scotland. And this is Duntell, built for defensive purposes, because there's a small entrance into which the homesteader could put his family and his few sheep and cattle. And that was when there were, when there were raids. Raids the... by the Vikings, yes. The age is attributed to the first century BC. So it's, it's 2,000 years since that was built. Now that's the only entrance. Now looking up there, you can see what, what a job it would have been to try and scale it. Oh yes, quite impossible. The wall seems to actually come out again at the top, slightly. Yeah. And inside you'll notice it's a double wall into which the settler and his family could, could conceal themselves so that the locals would position themselves up there and they could stop anybody coming in with stones and staves. Would there have been a roof on this, do you think? No, no roof. Unfortunately, you'll notice that the far side of the brock is gone. It's been used as a quarry by local people. But in its heyday, it must have been quite an impressive structure. Must have been, must have been. Yeah. Surprising to think that people were settled here 2,000 years ago, isn't it? But obviously they were, and subject to attack by the Vikings. Oh, that's very cleverly done. What's through there? Is that a, 
an entrance to the the wall passage. Yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a staircase on the other side there. Isn't That's there? right. Yeah. Yes, you could walk around between the two walls. So I suppose this would be living accommodation if they were yes. in here for any time. Yes. There's no sign of a well. There's no well here. Some have wells. There isn't one here. So, so they weren't. The they weren't. They weren't built for a permanent occupation. I mean, yeah. they're just temporary defences. Regular visitors to these parts over many years have witnessed a succession of changes that have taken place in the causes of tourism and economic development and are saddened. The replacement of the old narrow road by a fast highway and the consequent increase in tourist traffic have robbed this district of its former loneliness and sombre atmosphere. In earlier days, one met only Highlanders, quiet, courteous and welcoming. Mercifully, the mountains remain magnificently aloof. They cannot be changed. I remember walking through the woods from Shield Egg one day. And by the time I got to Alice, I was pretty hungry. Nobody said meals. No coffees, nothing like that. But there's a cottage standing alone in a field. And I thought, I'll, I'll see if they'll make me a drink. And I went there and said, I'm feeling rather hungry and tired. Could you make something for me? She said, yes, come in. And she was an elderly lady, and she put a wonderful meal on. Jam, scones, pot of tea. And the husband was sitting in the chair, and it turned out that he was totally crippled, couldn't move. So they must have had very little income at all. And when I came to pay, she wouldn't hear of it. Away with you. Nothing to pay, you're very welcome. <laughs> so that's the sort of Highland hospitality that I found in most places in the Highlands. Did you not find that? At times, you were treated with a sort of suspicion, and he was this—he was this strange old never. chap from the, his strange old chap from the no, district. No, no, even, even places who would never seen a visitor. No, it was always the same. Very friendly, very reluctant to charge you for anything they provided, although themselves were obviously living in poverty. No, it was quite touching at times. <laughs> 